Hello folks, welcome to our second video of this weekend um, in the um, uh, Pan-African Lecture Series. And today we are focusing on 19th century Southern Africa um, with a special emphasis on the Fekane or Difakane uh, series of, of events in the 1820s, um, as well as the advent of of the British on the on the coast on the on, in the Cape of South Africa, as well as the the movement of the of the Boers, if you will, which are the the Dutch settlers who are being pushed inland due to the settling of the of the British on the coast. So these are some of the things we'll be talking about today. Um, I've mentioned my disclaimers time and again in previous videos, so I won't uh, go into depth with that. But just a reminder that this is an introductory series, so um, we won't get into super depth. But if you are looking to get a conversation started on some of these historical uh, happenings, uh, this is a great place to start. And I'll also be leaving uh, links to to various things I talk about in the section below the video. So enjoy. Let's get started. Okay, so like I said, we're talking about Southern Africa in the 19th century. Our last video um, uploaded yesterday was focusing on the on Eastern Central Africa during the same time period. So a lot of the things that we talk about today, uh, imagine that we are building a map of these regions. So some of the things that we talk about today will have a direct correlation to what we spoke about yesterday uh, and will help us uh, further flesh out the context. So if you haven't watched that video, I recommend that you go back and watch it um, and, and it will help inform some of the dynamics we're talking about today. All right, so first we are talking about what we call them Fekane or here I say Andy Fekane um but typically the, the words are used synonymous and this describes a, the two words mean fekane in the nguni languages means crushing and difakane means uh, the scattering uh and these words refer to the same phenomenon which was a series of zulu and other nguni wars and forced migrations that changed the demographic, social, and political configuration of Southern and Central Africa and parts of Eastern Africa as well. If you watched our video yesterday, you already know we spoke about the, migra the Ngoni migrations, Ngoni, which is different from Nguni, uh, Ngoni with an O, the Ngoni migrations that led to the establishment of the Jere Ngoni in, in, in Eastern Africa, particularly in Tanzania. We spoke about the Kololo people, settling in um, in what is modern day Zambia, uh, conquering the, the Lozi people for a period. And even though they were eventually conquered by the 1860s, uh, they had introduced certain uh, political and military organization that endured with the, with, among the Lozi. And we also saw that when uh, Zwangendaba's group that ended up settling in Tanzania, made the made the trek uh, northwards they had stopped for a while on the zimbabwean plateau where part of their uh, part of their of their group stayed behind under the leadership of queen yamazana who ends up uh, this um who ends up uh, killing the last changamira mambo the last king of the roji people in zimbabwe so we've already started to see uh, the critical impact of the of the Fekan and Difakan, but we didn't go into depth with what had caused it in the first place and whatnot, and that's what we are doing today. So, the Fekan is as I've defined it, and it was caused by several different factors, right? One of the main ones uh, was the drought that that hit Southern Africa in the 18th in the late 18th century. So, from beginning in the 1700s, uh, I mean, in the 1790s into the early 1800s, there was a drought that, um, that caused much 
suffering and, and, and hunger, and thereby led to a competition in resources, um, led to, uh, to critical competition in resources. Uh, that was the that is the first reason. So there were many prominent groups in Southern Africa at the time, and right now we are talking specifically about what is modern day South Africa. Um, you know, and particularly in the area uh, we'll called the Zululand, mainly on the on the east on the eastern side of the country. So, so that was one reason. The other reason was there was the early onset of European settlement, right? Particularly the Portuguese, which we've spoken about in this series, who were involved in 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 the trade of ivory and these other things. So trying vying the the main groups in this area were vying for for these sort of commercial opportunities in partnering with the the portuguese and other european groups that were settling in at the time um and the groups we are talking about here include um the Nguane people led by sobuza the Nduandwe led by zwide and the mtetwa led by ndingiswayo and ndingiswayo will become important shortly as well uh, so, so the groups would fight over, over um, control of, of resources and uh, to be able to trade with the, with, uh, with the Europeans, um, among other things. So, so these groups, uh, as we've spoken about, were, you know, would, were warring like any groups would. Uh, that, that, that live in close proximity and are jog, joggling around for resources. Uh, but an important thing that happens was um, the death of Dingiswayo in 1818. Dingiswayo, who was the, the leader of one of the major sort of nation states we spoke about earlier, the, the Mtetwa. When he died, um, it created a power vacuum in the Mtetwa state. Now, the Mtetwa nation was made up of several different uh, clans. One of them was the Zulu clan, uh, which was led uh, by Sengaga Kona, uh, and uh, the Kumalo clan, which was led by Mzilikazi, among others. So after Dingiswayo's, uh, Dingiswayo, is killed in battle in 1818. One of the leaders of the, of the clans under the Mtetwa, which was the Zulu uh, people, Shaka rises to, to power. And he distinguishes himself. He was already beloved by, by Dengiswayo for his military argument, but he distinguishes himself and has so much, um, has so much ambition to grow the, 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 the Zulu, what was the Zulu clan then into a full empire. And his ambition in large part is what ends up causing a lot of conflict between him and others, uh, essentially where the name Fekane, uh, the crossing comes from, right? In which he would, uh, historically has been said, he would crush the, 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 the different uh, nations and other groups around him in a bit to absorb them into a growing Zulu kingdom. This starts to happen in 1818, and his, run, his reign lasts until 1828, but we'll talk more about Shaka in the, in the, in the following slide. Um, historians, however, have been debating the merits of the Mfetane. Indeed, it was a period that happened that led to the movement of several different groups. Uh, but as we have seen, uh, you know, with the with the documentation of history by by European settlers and other colonialists, it often served to to posit the African leaders as being more, or the African communities as being more savage and more barbaric than they actually were. So this idea of the Zulu and Shark in particular being almost cannibalistic in his in his treatment of 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 rival groups and even his own people may have been exaggerated. So the historiography of this has been debated uh, lately and perhaps we can have a, a, at a later date if there's enough interest, we may have that uh, uh, conversation and maybe even bring in some experts to talk about that. Let me know if there's something you'd be interested in in the comments. Um, so yes, that's about 
those are the main those are some of the causes of them fake what were the effects though so the effects include of course loss of life with thousands of people losing their lives uh due to this conflict um and there's no overstating that right uh and and a critical effect that is still visible today was the foundation of several different groups as different people fled from from uh from shaka's reign uh including uh Tendebele, who are now settled in zimbabwe uh we will talk about them uh, a bit later settled in Zimbabwe, which is north of the Limpopo to South Africa under the leadership of Mzili Gazi. Um, the Gaza uh, key, um, Empire, which, which was established in, in modern day Mozambique as well, under the leadership of Soshangani. Then the, the Soto Kingdom, which was established under the leadership of Moshoeshwe, which is modern day Lesotho, and we'll talk about them as well. Then of course we spoke about the Ngoni migrations, which led to the establishment of the of the the, the Jere Ngoni people in Tanzania, as well as the settlement of the Kololo people among the the Lozi people in modern day Zambia. Now I keep saying modern day because all these countries were in their pre-colonial state at this point, so they went by different names, right? A lot of them, for example, the name Zimbabwe does not come into play until after independence in 1980, but we're just talking about the space that existed at the time and it's different names um, indeed. So these are some of the effects of the, of the Mfekane, a very important period that shaped Southern Africa as we know it today, um, the Mfekane. So let's look at some of the principal actors of the, of the Mfekane here. Okay, so as I said earlier, Shaka was the son of, of Senzaga Kona, right? Um, and he, he had distinguished himself. Remember I was explaining that the, the Zulu clan was one of the several clans that were under the Mteta nation led by Dingiswayo. Um, and Shaka had distinguished himself as a military leader uh, such that he had earned the favor of Dengiswai, who continued to position him, um, even positioned him as the leader of the of the of the of the Zulu clan after Senzaga Kona's passing. So, with the passing of Dengiswai himself, Shaka rose to the top and got to work consolidating the the different clans under the Mtetwa Nation into under the leadership of the Zulu uh, structures which would grow to become the Zulu kingdom. So he is, so Shaka is credited with several military innovations. Credited, and that's key, uh, because it, it is, uh, you know, there, there's historical debates about some of these things. So among them include the innovation of the short stabbing spear, right? Um, mm -hmm as well as the cow horn military formation, the cow horn military formation, which is the one in which uh, if you play chess or if you're just uh, a military strategist, you may know this is the idea of, is the idea of um, encircling your, you know, most people would go full frontal in confrontation in battle, but it's the idea of encircling much like the, the horns of a cow go, where some people go straight on, but others are in circle your, your, your forces in this way, which should uh, be more effective. So he's one of the people uh, credited with innovating that. Um, you know, both, however, you know, both innovations had been developed and were in use in the region before uh, the rise of the Zulu Kingdom. Uh, so starting between the 1790s, for example, uh, some of these things were already in play, but however, we cannot deny that Shaka brought them to prominence within his reign. Um, same thing with the short stabbing spear, which if you watch the last video, I spoke about the Kololo using it as well. And that was very well a part of them having picked it up from, from rising, from having come from 
the same area as, as Saka did before they were pushed out by the Mfekani. Um, so the, the idea of the short stabbing spear was prior to that, people had used this, uh, before the 1790s, people had used this long, the Nguni people had used these long spears uh, that served as sort of javelins, uh, which would, uh, which would, which were less lethal for the most part, less accurate, less lethal. It was you just told them until the other side gave up people would have died. Where the short stabbing spear allowed you to get real close to them and in proximity, um, as you stab people, in the, the, um, it's more decisive than the carnage is higher, it's more deadly that way. So while these short stabbing spears have been introduced prior, uh, you can see here Shaka is holding one such spear which you can contrast with say a, a javelin sort of spear. Um, Indeed. Then the other thing too is he's credited with, is credited with the creation of the Zulu kingdom. Now again, the Zulu people had been around for longer than for way before Shaka, right? But as I was explaining earlier, they were more of a clan under the leadership of of, of different people, including Senzanga Kona, who's Shaka's own father. But they had been around for even before then. But it was Shaka's ambition and. Um, and military and political brilliance that allowed him to grow uh, the Zulu kingdom. So when you talk about the Zulu today, that's why we talk about even when people talk about Shaka the Zulu, um, it may be a misnomer uh, in that that wasn't really his name, but he was, you know, the kingdom, the Zulu kingdom as we got to know it, and as it actually endures today uh, as, a, as, a, as a dominant, as the most populous community within uh, within Southern Africa, really, um, a large part of that is, is due to, to, to Shaka's conquest in the 10 years that he was in, in charge. Um, one of the ways in which he was able to ascertain his authority was through this cult of Indunas, right? These Indunas were regimental leaders who he appointed himself uh, and uh, while local authority remained in the hands of the hereditary chiefs, uh, his structures of local support here enabled Shaka to quickly gain uh, unchallenged control to the Zulu chiefdom. So by appointing these Indunas who were already respected in their own communities, Shaka was able to grow his kingdom that way. Um, and uh, one of the king, king, one of the regimental leaders actually uh, was a, was Mzilikazi, who we will talk about later. So just to show how this goes. Then of course, as, as these cases go, there was a lot of infighting, a lot of power jostling, and ultimately Shaka was killed by his half brother, Dingane, in 1828, um, who then got to work in uh, consolidating his own rule by killing off potential rivals, including their other half brother, who had assisted in, 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 um, in the assassination of Shaka. So, you know, it's a whole Game of Thrones sort of thing happening here. So, but Shaka was, was in charge for a period of nine to 10 years, which, during which the, the Zulu kingdom grew, during which much of the Fekane uh, migrations took place, um, as we shall see shortly. And uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about Shaka. And uh, before we move on, let me also say he's one of the most debated um, figures, together with Mfekane as a, as, a, as a phenomenon, the legacy of Shaka as he's been portrayed in, the, in, the, in European writings has made him look a, like a bloodthirsty, you know, sort of cannibalistic African barbarian. But as conversations and, and as historians, there's more African historians are uh, taking to the page over the past five decades or so, there's been a change in that narrative. And I will put in the section below some, some great sources that are problematizing the way in which Shaka has been depicted over the years. Okay. All right, so one of the kings that grew out of the, uh, one of the kingdoms that grew out of them, um, um, Fekane was uh, the Mshweshwe, uh, uh, was the Soto kingdom led by King Mushweshwe, who you see here in the picture looking dapper. Um, Mushweshwe, 
So the name Mushwe Shwe actually stems from uh, the sound that uh, that that when you are stealing is is this sort of swish swish sound of shaving, which was a metaphor for the way in which Mushwe Shwe expertly could uh, capture his, the the rival his rival's cattle. So who's Mushwe Shwe? So Mushwe Shwe was uh, again he was a notorious cattle raider before he was even the king um and during the mfekane period the early years of the mfekane in the early 1820s um he established his own kingdom on the slopes of a mountain a little bit uh f further away from uh from from shaka's uh control at which point he distinguished himself as a military leader and the minor chiefdoms and displaced people willingly came under his protection. Now they wanted protection from, from Shaka's advances, right? And, uh, and eventually he moved even further up the hill, uh, settled in the, you know, on, 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 on the mountain called Taba Mosiu, Taba Mosiu, and uh, which gave them a strong defensive pro position uh, able to withstand several sieges from, from the Zulu and other groups. And it also had great access to grazing and fresh water, uh, which was important for him since he, he, uh, since he focused on, 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 on cattle, on cattle rearing, a very um, pastoralist community. One of the things that Mushwe Shwe distinguished himself with, and you can see how, even how he is dressed here as compared to how Shaka and other folks were dressed, uh, he's, he's distinguished himself as a, as a consummate diplomat, right? He was very well known for his diplomacy. He would raid smaller kingdoms, which he wasn't averse to, but he would also offer them protection, as I've already explained, which would allow them to, uh, to sort of come under his control, if you will. Uh, he would also pay tribute to the stronger ones, the uh, stronger kingdoms, including uh, sending furs to Shaka himself, who you would think he would, might have wanted nothing to do since he, since he had, um, since he, it was him, he had fled. And he also um, would send cattle to the Nguane people, which was the other major group uh, that had been in competition with the, with the Zulu early on. So you will do these things. He even invited Christian missionaries into the kingdom in the 1830s, which was not necessarily because he, of his faith or anything like that. It was because he wanted uh, to, the support of the European, the, the backing of the Europeans who had uh, um, guns and, and horses, which he was able to incorporate into his kingdom, such that by the 1840s, he had one of the most formidable kingdoms. So he went from notorious cattle raider just before the Mfekane, fled uh, the Mfekane and set up his own kingdom in what is modern day Lesotho. And the Soto are named for, for, for this, you know, the Lesotho is named for uh, the Basoto kingdom, which were led by Moshwe Shwe here. So that's a little bit about Moshwe Shwe, uh, you know, by the 1830s and 40s, he was able to become one of the most formidable African powers in Southern Africa. So that's a little bit about Moshe Shwe. Now, another, so now we've seen that the Kololo, as part of the Ngoni migrations, fled uh, the Mfekane. We've seen how um, Moshe Shwe and the Soto Kingdom were established out of the Mfekane as well. Another important uh, person who we mentioned in the last video briefly was uh, King Mzilikazi. Now, Mzilikazi had come out of the Kumalo clan, which was another clan, much like the Zulu clan, within the Mtetkwa nation led by Dengiswan. And once Saka took control and the Zulu kingdom started to grow, it went from being a fellow clan and sort of sub, um, subjugating the Kumalo clan uh, with, with um, Zilikaz as, as, the, as a regimental leader of the Kumalo clan alongside with other clans that had been uh, sort of uh, taken under the control of, 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 the, 
of the Zulu of the growing Zulu kingdom under Saka. In 19 in 1822, in 1822, um, um, Zilikazi, the, and now there's debates, historical debates about this, but it comes down to Mzilikazi was not content with sub, submitting to Saka. So he might have done so for a very brief period in the first couple of years, but the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, was, was when he had to give um, a portion of his crown, which is to say several of his cattle as tribute to Saka, and he was not having that. So he ends up fleeing uh, Shaka's rule in 1822 and would settle for a while among the Soto people, right? At which point he received the name uh, Matebele, which uh, there's debates about this, but some people have said it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is a reference to this idea of them staying in the, in the high veld. It's, uh, it's to say people of the high veld. They were originally called the Amatabele, a name that they end up adopting themselves into Amandebele. Amandebele, which is where the term Debele here comes. Amandebele. Um, and they stayed on the southeastern border with Botswana. I wish I'd put the graphic here. For a while, uh, they, they settled there. This is still within modern day South Africa, which was in South Africa at the time, but still they hadn't crossed over the Limpopo. That's the big thing. And eventually, and they stayed there for, and he styled his rule after the Induna. So it was a very efficient military type rule based on Shaka's own um, structures of, 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 of rulership. And, in, and they stayed there for 10, 15 years under constant attack though from rival groups, including the Grika, um, you know, the Zulu every now and then would, would, would reach that far. And, um, the Rolong, and finally the Boers as well. Now the Boers were, you know, the, the, the Dutch settlers who were being pushed inland, which we will talk about shortly as well, who were being pushed inland by the settlement of the British on the Cape, uh, where they were coming more inland and, and coming into contact with these different African groups and, and displacing them as well. So eventually that pushed um, Zilikazi to move to the north, north of the Limpopo, and settling in 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 modern day Zimbabwe or the area we now call Matabele land in in, in modern day Zimbabwe. There, and uh, I must I must uh, admit that this may be a little bit of a misnomer here that they conquer the Roji state because if you remember last week we spoke about how the Swazi people. Um, as part of the Ngoni migrations mm -hmm. under the leadership of Queen Yamazana had landed in, in Zimbabwe and actually um, Yamazana had killed, or at least the soldiers, the troops had killed the last Changamire Mambo, which, uh, which was essentially a nail in the coffin of the, of the Roji Empire as we knew it, um, which had already been on, on, its, um, on its deathbed due to Portuguese uh, infiltration uh, prior to that. So it may be a stretch to say the Mzilikazi came and conquered the Roger state. However, the arrival of the, of, of the Ndebele really put out any embers that were still in existence at that point. And actually, um, Mzilikazi ends up marrying um, Queen Yamazana in, in the early 1840s, 1843, I believe, and thereby unifying those two groups and sort of submerging them under this title of the, of the, of the Ndebele people, which only gave them more power in the region. And we'll talk a little more about their relationships with the, with the, with the, with the uh, Shona people, uh, the different um, Shona groups that were there. Um, and let me just bring this back on to say, Shona groups because that term itself was coined a lot later, but we're talking about those people that the Karanga people and other groups uh, or remnants of the Roji state. Um, we'll talk a little more about their relationship a bit later. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's Mzilikazi and then the Bela kingdom. So we've spoken about the Debele kingdom, the Soto kingdom, and if we talk about the Kololo 
and then going in migrations, we're starting to develop a picture. I believe at some point we will talk about the Gaza Empire as well, which is another prominent community that come out, comes out of this Mfekane um, phenomenon. Now, taking it back to the Cape, this has all been within the interior of South Africa, all these dynamics we've been talking about. But now, what is happening at the Cape? At the Cape, remember, well, earlier in 1652, the Dutch had settled on the Cape of South Africa um, on their way to India, right? So again, I should have added the map here, but if you can imagine people coming, you know, travelers, explorers, and traders coming from Western Europe, right, from, uh, from Western Europe, coming down the west coast of Africa on their way around to India, where they would have to go up the Indian Ocean, uh, down the Atlantic Ocean through to the Indian Ocean. South Africa posits a perfect, uh, perfect spot to establish a sort of halfway house. So the Dutch had established that in 1652. Um, and continued to, and eventually settled. In, in, initially, they just meant to stop by, but they had settled and grown their community as the, uh, as the uh, what became known as the Boers, which is a term for, for farmers um, and such, and uh, conquered and, and uh, enslaved several groups, which is a video that I will make later as part of this series, even though chronologically it comes before this. So the British themselves sort of entering this arena later for the same reasons, they were also on their way to India. Uh, they establish a, 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 a spot in the Cape as well, right? In the Cape as well, and seize the Cape from the Dutch, right? They were able to overcome the Dutch pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, the Dutch settlers who, Again, the other name that they're colloquially known by is the Boers. So they were able to establish that and immediately thereafter would, would establish what was called the Hot and Tart Code. Now the Hot and Tart Code is important at this point because it, it provides a blueprint for what would become the past laws of the apartheid era. What was the Hot and Tart Code? The Hot and Tart Code said, all Khoisan, Khoisan were the, the native people uh, the native indigenous groups of, 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 of Southern Africa uh, and free black people had to carry passes to show who their employer was. If they didn't have the, the pass, they would be contracted to the nearest white farmer who needed them. So, so it's essentially nuanced enslavement, right? So if you did not have a pass with you, you would be contracted to whatever white person needed labor nearest to you. So in a way, even though the Dutch had been, had been conquered here, they still benefited from this system because the, the labor would very much go to them as well. Um, then eventually, a number of Christian missionaries arrived from Europe to work among what they call the heathen natives uh, within the colony. And because even though these Christian missionaries are the handmaidens of, of colonialism. Um, they still had this bleeding heart narrative to them, right? So they soon became champions of the poor and oppressed Khoisan of the Cape and would uh, fight for them in the courts and encourage them to develop independent uh, sort of farming and which gave them some sort of freedom which gave the, the, the Khoisan some freedom. And you know who hated this? The Boers, because the, before the British came, the Boers had essentially enslaved these folks. These folks had no rights. They had defeated them in battle, so they, they, they had their way with them. So now the Boers resented them. But if the Boers resented the British already for seizing the Cape and, and compromising their control of the Khoisan, they were about to really hate them. This is because the British established a standing army on the Cape, right? In Cape Town, which could be summoned 
uh, when, when, when need arose, okay? So what it did was the Dutch uh, settlers who had some autonomy and who had some version of resistance prior to this were now fully under the control of the Trek Boers. I mean, sorry, of the, that's the, the Trek Boers is the other term for the Dutch community, which is a combination of the, loosely translates to the, to the standing farmers, I mean, to the traveling farmers, um, to, the, to the traveling farmers. And indeed, so that the, the Dutch community was brought under the control of the British, essentially. The other thing that happened was the Tosa people, who were the large African community, large sedentary African community within that region that had had a series of wars with the, with the Dutch since they settled in the 1650s and had been able to withstand them in three wars known as the Frontier Wars, were finally obliterated because of the military might of the British Standing Army. So they were finally obliterated in the Fourth and Fifth Frontier Wars, okay? Um, in, the, in the Fourth pr Frontier War, um, they, you know, they, and the Fifth War, they uh, pretty much clear the area of, uh, clear, clear the area of any Tosa people, right? So this puts the Tosa people even more inland. So that's a little bit about the British arrival, a very violent arrival to, to, to the Cape Colony. Okay. So what is the overwhelming result of this? So one of the things that happens is if you, is, is where the mythology of Africana, when we say Africana, the word spelled A-F-R, I-K-A-N-E-R. It's a term that became more popular in the late 19th century and early 20th century to define, um, that's the name that the Dutch settlers soon developed for themselves. That it became known as the Africana population with their language known as Afrikaans. So a lot of their mythology, right, derives from what they call the Great Trek the great trek of the 1830s. Um, and what is this? This was when several thousand families uh, and their servants trekked northwards from the Cape, right? They're coming from the, from the Cape here where they had settled. And they trekked northwards uh, in this general direction in what has become known as, Africana historians and nationalists have glorified this movement, movement as the great trek the founding event of Africana culture uh, and the earliest experience of Africana nationalism. So even though in reality, it was a series of small different tracks, it has been romanticized in history as this big move, almost synonymous with, with, um, with the Israelites living Egypt in the biblical story. Yeah? So, so the only issue that even though they united them was the was a desire for freedom from the British government control and combined with free access to stretches of new land. Um, now bear in mind that when they talk about new land here, uh, free land, there were already people settled here, right? Different African groups settled here. But for them, if, if they did not have the military might of the British, they, they fancied their chances and in fact hoped that there would be different African groups there so they could, um, you know, so they could have some free labor as well. So earlier on, the, the Tosas had blocked their movement, but like I said, the Tosas had been obliterated in battle with the, with the British eventually. Uh, then later on, they encountered the Zulu uh, people now under Dingane. Uh, remember who we said I was Shaka's half brother, we had killed him. And in the beginning, the Zulus were able to, to resist pretty well, uh, wiping out, wiping out uh, early uh, Treka armies um, in 1838. But when the Trekkers regrouped uh, with 500 guns, uh, with the guns of 500 Boers were successfully able to defeat uh, the Zulu army. Uh, which were, in which they killed 3,000 Zulus. 
And this battle soon became known as the Battle of Blood River. Um, you know, this was because it was fought on the, on the Tome River. And, uh, you know, as you can imagine, with 3,000 people being killed, the river turned red. So it, be it became known as the Battle of Blood River. And th thereafter, um, the Dutch established Natalia, um, which was a, uh, a republic wanting to be independent from, again, setting up their own republic. Um, it will be around here, and I'll explain shortly why that's represented by a British flag. Uh, they established uh, Natalia. That didn't last long, because by 1843, uh, Natalia itself was annexed by the British in order to prevent it falling into rival European hands. So again, at that point, even though they had settled the, 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 the uh, trekkers, they ended up moving more inland here as well. Uh, you know, having, you know, they had just settled there, but now they were being forced to, to move inland. Um, indeed. So, so let's, let's talk about this map real quick. So over here, right, this is, this is the Cape Colony here, which had been the domain initially prior to the, to the Dutch settling there, had been uh, uh, the domain of the Khoi people, right? Or known as the Khoi San. These are the indigenous people of this group. When the Dutch settled there, initially they had, there had been some trade sort of relationships, uh, but eventually once they settled there, uh, once they went back on their promise of having this as a halfway house on their way to India, um, they settled here and enslaved and, 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 and killed uh, the, the Khoisan people. Uh, and this would happen for, and even started enslaving um, other folks as well from, uh, from Madagascar as far out as Malaysia. Um, then the British settled here in, 16, in 1795, end of the 18th century. And based on those dynamics, the British start to push with their standing army, start to push the the Dutch more inland where they land in Zululand for a short while. They also get displaced from there and they end up saying, so this entire orange territory here is essentially the heart land of Africana nationalism. That, that's where they eventually settled. And um, this year, so this area here is largely where South Africa, oh, sorry, here, is where modern day South Africa uh, coincides with. This is modern day Namibia, this is modern day Botswana, and this is modern day Zimbabwe. Uh, and we'll talk about all those places as we go more into the late 19th century and 20th century and the scramble for Africa. So that's a little bit about the war and trade resistance uh, through which the, the Boers are uh, fearing oppression from the British on the coast, now, now settled on the coast, moved inland and stacked a claim to, to, to large bits of land uh, within the interior of South Africa, often, almost always at the expense of the different African groups that are settled there. That's a little bit about the, the and it becomes indeed the, the definitive mythology of the Africana nation that would even sustain them during the apartheid era uh, and to this day, a lot of them still talk about, even though they were settlers and colonialists here, they still talk about their presence in this region as being uh, uh, God-given, God-mandated, manifest destiny uh, sort of thing. Um, and a lot of this stems from the, from this great trek that they that they uh, that they engaged in. Okay, so now we've reached the end of this. Uh, of this presentation, this lecture, are key words to remember. What does mfekane and difakane mean? And what were the causes and effects of it? Then also consider problematizing it. What stories have been told by historians uh, that complicate this narrative? What are three innovations that Shaka is credited with? Right, we spoke about them. And also, be sure to problematize them, right? Or at least to question them and to say, well, some of those things existed beforehand. In fact, all of them existed beforehand. And in what form did they exist prior to Shaka? And what was the form that he 
took them to prominence, if you will. Uh, let's talk about the founding king of the Soto people and the founding king of the Ndebele people. What was the reason that the founding leader of the Ndebele people fled uh, Shaka's rule, right? Where did he end up eventually? Um, who did he marry, right? What was the hot and tart cold? What was the effect of having a British standing army in the Cape? It was a couple of different ones. And who are the war trekkers? Who are the war trekkers? Um, so these are some of the overwhelming questions that I want you to engage with, that I hope you can engage with uh, for this week. And let's continue this conversation. Uh, let me know what you think of this presentation in the comments. I will leave other sources in the, in the section below the video. And till next time, until next time, I will see you guys and stay learning, stay reading, uh, and enjoy the presentations in the